Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. When you read enough of the UFO literature that's out there floating around, uh, you come to realize pretty quickly that uh, uh, the, the beings that people encounter, it's not just uh, uh, localized to the greys, reptilians, and mantises et al. Uh, type of being. It's, it, there's a whole variety of different kinds that people encounter over the, have, have encountered over the decades. And, uh, for instance, like the 1973 Pascagoula, Mississippi case where uh, two work buddies, uh, Calvin Parker and uh, Charles Hickson, uh, after work one night, they went fishing, and the next thing you know, some kind of a craft lands behind them, and uh, next thing you know, they're getting dragged in, into it by these uh, by three robot-style kind of beings, and they, they're, they're forced to, into an examination, and then they're placed right back to where they were found, and, and, and the craft flies away. Uh, there's a lot of cases like that. A lot of cases like that. It's interesting, you know. The usually when people encounter the Greys, they they don't remember it at all. It, it takes them years till they realize that they're getting abducted on a regular basis. So some people actually remember bits and pieces, and there are some that remember the entire experience. Uh, but for the most part, it seems like a lot of people out there who encounter these the Greys and the uh, the mantis beings. Uh, and sometimes reptilians, it seems like uh, they, they don't remember it after it happens. They are, and they have to go under hypnotic regression to recover the memories of the experiences. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> But in other cases, there are weird encounters that people have. And it seems like, it, like for instance, in that Pascagoula case, the... Uh, Hickson and Parker remembered everything. Now, there was nothing that they forgot. They 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 remembered the entire experience. Like I guess these beings didn't have the courtesy to uh, blank their memories uh, uh, before they put them back. Uh, and the case that we're going to talk about today is similar to that. And these involve robot-like creatures. And uh, this guy was absolutely traumatized. This happened in Brazil back in 1977. And it was uh, originally investigated by the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, which is now defunct. And uh, But this is an interesting case that uh, uh, I, I, was, I always wanted to talk about on the show. And then today we're going to do so. And uh, here's an article from UFO Evidence. This is based, this is information, this website here got this information from the now defunct APRO. And this is the article, uh, this is the incident that occurred on September 15th, 1977 in a, uh, a village uh, called Paciencia, uh, which is near Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And it says here, Antonio La Rubia, a 33-year-old bus driver, encountered a huge object, which he estimated to be 75 meters, or 235 feet, across, sitting in a field near his home. He decided to retreat, but was unable to do so, for at the moment he started to run, an, in an intensely bright light lit up the area, and he was unable to move. At that moment, Antonio saw three robots positioned near him, and he was captured and taken into the disc. Yeah, so this guy gets up really early in the morning, like it's after around 2 o'clock in the morning to go to work. He's a bus driver in Brazil back in 77. And uh, he goes out of, outside of his house and he sees this thing sitting there in the distance. He, he thinks it might be the bus. And then he gets closer to it and next thing you know, he realizes it's not a bus. Anyway, let's go through the, the article here a little bit. <clears throat> anyway, the, the uh, field investigator at the, who looked into this case was someone named Irene Granchi of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and uh, uh, it says here, with her characteristic thoroughness, Mrs. Granchi forwarded translations of the complete texts of the newspaper stories, which initially carried the story, which included a number of errors which she cleared up before submitting her final report. And it says here she uh, she traveled uh, to Paciencia, the site of the incident, which is uh, about 28 miles from Rio, on Saturday, October 8th. So it was about a month after, uh, well, a little less than a month after the incident happened. And she interviewed a doctor there who had examined the victim. The victim is, and uh, of course, Antonio La Rubia. At the time, uh, when she first initially went to, went to investigate it, the guy was still shook up, like you know, several weeks after the incident. And then she had a uh, meet with meet up with them again uh and then when she did uh this is what she found out she says here antonio la rubia habitually arises at 2 a.m brushes his teeth washes and leaves his home at 2 15 or 2 20 a.m on the morning in question he 
feels he must have left around 220 for that was when he's his watch stopped yeah actually so he he leaves his house and and then he encounters this has this encounter and his watch stopped for the entire uh incident <clears throat> says here on the morning in question he feels he must have left at 220 for that was when his watch stopped he walked to a large field near his home and when he got to uh, when he got to the near corner of it he stopped short for in the field sat an object which he estimated to be 70 uh, meters or 235 feet across at least as the field is 70 meters across and the object's bulk extended beyond the boundaries of the field antonio thought the object which was a leaden color and shaped like a hat was resting on the ground however a search made by mrs Granchi and antonio at a later date revealed no vestiges of a landing such as impressions burned grass etc although mrs Granchi feels that uh, they could have missed them so yeah they went back to try to investigate this case at, at, uh, over about a month after it happened and there was no evidence uh, that, that there was something in the field where it was but you know uh, unfortunately, that's the case in a lot, a, a lot of times. You know, people have these experiences, and they, they all all they have is their word. But when you hear this story, I think this guy was uh, most certainly telling the truth because, again, he was very traumatized by everything that happened to him. <clears throat> it says here, as soon as Mr. LaRubia realized what he was seeing, he had never believed in the existence of UFOs previously. He decided to run back home. Uh, initially, LaRubia thought the object was the bus he had he had had to ride to go to the terminal of the Oriental Bus Company where he was employed as a bus driver. He was unable to run, however, for at the moment he decided to retreat, an intensely bright light lit up the area. LaRubia was standing by an electric pole which became illuminated by the brilliant blue light. Now, let me just stop there for a second. Isn't that interesting? How many cases over, you know, you read about in the literature where they're, they're somehow these aliens, could, they, they, they point something at you or, or, or there's a light that gets shined on you and you can't move all of a sudden. Uh, so many cases like that. Imagine having that kind of power. Anyway, continue here, continuing here, it says, At that moment, Antonio saw three robots positioned near him. They were one meter uh, and 40 centimeters, about four feet tall, but their antenna, which jutted out of the middle tops of their heads, extended far enough to extend beyond his height, which is approximately five feet five inches. The heads of the creatures were shaped like American footballs, with a band extending around the middle horizontally, which looked like a row of small mirrors of a blue shade, one a little darker than the others. <clears throat> the bodies, Antonio said, were stocky, the trunk broader than his own. He is muscular, but of slender build. They had appendages for arms, which he compared to elephant's trunks, and which narrowed down to pointed tips, resembling one finger. Their bodies were made of a rough substance resembling scales. Antonio said he didn't think the scales were armor for the robots, uh, moved around freely, and the scales did not seem to impede them in any way. The trunks were rounded at the bottom, ending in a single leg. Antonio's first impression was that they were sitting on something, but didn't feel this was the case. This leg ended in a, in a platform the size and shape of a saucer. Antonio compared this leg and platform to the stools utilized on ships. All of this outer part of the bodies looked like a dull shade of aluminum. In the field, so let me just stop there for a second. Obviously, I think these things are robots that 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 you were encountering. Just like I, I I believe that those Pascagoula creatures were probably robots, just like Hickson and Parker said. So I don't think that, you know. But then again, what do we know? Maybe <laughs> I can't imagine that these things could, these things could be biological, right? <clears throat> it says here, in the field, one of the robots stood in front of him, one at the side and and another behind him. When the blue light had come on, he could no longer move. Antonio flailed, flailed about with his arms, but found he was imprisoned in a bell jar. Uh, so that, that sort of felt like he felt like he was in some sort of, he could move his arms, but he couldn't move any further than that because there was some kind of invisible force field around there keeping him uh, in that position. Uh, it was like, a, but it was shaped like a, like a jar. He couldn't see anything, but that's what it was. Otherwise, he felt quite normal, except that he felt quite nervous. He could not move, but the creatures floated along. They were all of the same stature, but one of them was holding what appeared to be a syringe. This robot raised its appendage, pointed the syringe at La Rubia, and Antonio moved from his position, without feeling it, toward the disc. Although he felt himself moving toward the disc, he does not know how he entered it. As he approached it, he felt a tremor, then found himself in a corridor of aluminum substance and beyond it a wall. 
Two of the robots went one way, one another. He looked down the corridor, saw the field, and it seemed that the skin of the UFO was transparent, and he felt the craft had lifted from the ground. He got the impression the object was moving from south to north. So once he got in the craft, I mean, you're looking out of it, it's like you're, you're inside of it, but you're look, you're able, he's able to look out at the field, and it was like it was transparent, like an in, invisibility. Like how many times we talk about that invisibility? These these beings have the the, the ability. Uh, to, to make the craft that they fly around in invisible. <clears throat> As he was looking back and out, a bright blue light came on again, and he now found himself in a large circular room. The light appeared to come from the ceiling and became lighter in you as it came down the wall until it blended with the aluminum color of the walls. In this huge chamber, he saw dozens of the entities on one side and another 12 on the other side, reminding him of children in a classroom because their single legs look like seats. <laughs> Antonio, imagine this. Just imagine getting up for work at two thirty, two o'clock in the morning, walking out the door, and then all of a sudden, this is happening to you. What, like walking into a jackpot, right, right, right when you wake up in the morning, something like this. Incredible. Antonio had been struggling all the while, unable to make a sound, but suddenly he was able to shout, "What do you want? Who are you?" To his great surprise, all of the creatures fell to the floor, and he assumed that the sound of his voice must have caused this. The light came on strong again, blinding him. He continued to struggle, partly from fear, but also because he had an, had had extreme difficulty breathing since he first entered the craft. He did not hear his own breathing, but could hear breathing sounds coming from the entities, which was puzzling to him as they appeared to him to be robots. Now that's interesting. That's what I. That's, you know, this story. When you think about it, okay. So are they robots or are they some sort of a biological form that look like robots? Uh, I guess we will never know, right? Or maybe someday we will know. But why were they making breathing sounds? That's weird. When Antonio began shouting, all the entities raised their appendages to the tip of their antenna holding them. Prior to that, the antenna had been spinning so fast that he could not determine their exact shape. When they held them with their appendages, he could see that their shape resembled that of a teaspoon. The only fixture, fixture in the whole enclosure was a small piano-like affair in front of Antonio. It was a box-shaped thing about 15 to 17 centimeters or 6 inches in width, standing on two supporting poles, which reached to the height of Antonio's chest. At the extremity of the box on each side, there were antenna jutting up and to one side the keys, which reminded him of a piano. There was also something that looked like a tin can on it, into which the beings inserted some objects which they took from their belts. At this juncture, Antonio explained that the beings wore belts from which hung, by hooks, apparatuses which resembled syringes, which they inserted into the piano, or, or the box, which looked like a piano. Each time this was done, an image appeared on the wall of the UFO in color, showing a different scene. Antonio was shown a series of pictures in color, and every time this was done, the being introduced the syringe-like thing to the box, pressed a key, and the picture appeared. The pictures Antonio remembers are as follows. Now, so basically what he's saying here is this. So, each of these robots, one by one, there was two dozen in this room that he was in, one by one started putting in uh, this, looked like a syringe to him, into this box. And every time one of these one of the beings did it, images would show up on this screen in front of him. And then when it was over, then the next robot would come up and put it the syringe, and then he would see another scene. And it would show, if they're trying to give him some kind of a message, I don't know what that message is. Uh, now, the investigator uh, provided some uh, commentary on that at the end of the story. We'll get into that later. But I find this fascinating because this happens a lot. You, it's almost like like even with the greys sometimes. You read a lot of the abduction uh, stories with, with the greys, and, and, and people are shown kinds of all kinds of different imagery. Usually it's not good kind of Im imagery. And uh, and then they're they're, they're they're you know they don't even remember it. The only reason, the only time they remember it is when they're uh, they go under hypnotic regression, and then, then they remember it. So it's it's really weird, all of this. I mean, they're these aliens are giving us messages sometimes. Now, the, the, when it comes to the grades, it doesn't it doesn't seem like they want us to uh, the, they want the people they abduct to tell everybody else. But in this case, you have to wonder. This is different. Now, these are different kinds of beings. Now, what we'll go through each of these. Uh, images that he was shown and, and see if you can make any sense out of it but maybe there's something there that we're supposed to try to figure out i don't know 
Okay, number one, the first image that he saw, himself nude, lying on an invisible table, swinging his arms about, his legs lying straight, and two of the beings examining him with their little bluish lights, directing it at his chest and head, with another entity examining his head with a blue light, which had no beam. It made everything blue, including his hair, which he saw in the picture. So they're showing him pictures of him, him, well, he's sitting there watching this, a picture of him laying on a table naked, and they're examining, why these beings are examining him. What, what, what's this supposed to mean? Like, well, let's continue reading it. It says here, when this scene was over, another being approached the console, introduced another thing into it, and another scene appears. Uh, and then the second one here, Antonio saw himself still naked standing. And then the third image, he says, Antonio was dressed, carrying his shopping bag. His teeth were chattering and he looked nervous. No sound came from him and one arm was swinging. And then the fourth one, the picture showed a horse and a cart being drawn over a dirt road. Antonio did not recognize the location, but there appeared a cart man, a peasant, wearing a straw hat, barefooted and with a torn shirt. And then the fifth picture, Antonio saw a picture of a light orangey ball with himself standing beside it. And then in the sixth picture, this the ball was seen once again, but this time bluish in color with one of the beings standing beside it. And in the seventh uh, seventh image, this picture is most difficult to describe, and, and whereas we have condensed Mrs. Granchi's words before, we will use her entire description. A dog was shown trying to get at one of those beings. Also shown in the picture, the dog was big and slobbering at the mouth, trying hard to get at the being, unable to reach it, and looked very angry. Then the dog gave out four or five barks. At this point, the being started to melt from top to bottom like porridge. And then in the eighth image, a factory was seen, apparently one of theirs, where the UFOs are manufactured. The scene was white and stretched out, so he could not see the end of it. There were three rows of UFOs. The two on the right were UFOs nearly ready, and the one on the left were UFOs in the making at the skeleton stage. There were millions of beings, or robots, walking around, but Antonio noticed no tools. And then the ninth image, this picture showed a train like the Japanese trains currently being used in Brazil, but older, something the worse for wear, windowless, entering a tunnel, whereupon it was lost from view. And then the tenth image here says this showed an avenue, which Mrs. Granchi compared with the avenue of Presidenta Vargas, one of the busiest thoroughfares in Rio de Janeiro, jammed with cars. <clears throat> and then uh, Antonio's list seems to end here, but that he described a scene he saw after the one where he saw himself naked, wherein he saw himself dressed, vomiting, and passing stools in his trousers. Fortunately, the latter did not come to pass as he was at home when he became very ill. Antonio also told Mrs. Granchi about when the beings took blood from him. So they actually did take some blood from this guy uh, while he was in there. One of them came over to the center of the hall where he was standing, took one of the syringes from his belt with his right appendage, passed it over to his left appendage where it started to rotate, spinning so fast that Antonio could not follow it with his eyes. Then the gadget was pointed at him whereupon his arm lifted against his will and the syringe was stuck into the middle finger of his right hand. He saw the syringe filling until it nearly overflowed. He was sure it was his blood for it was the only color he saw in the whole place. Everything else was blue or white white or metallic like he didn't understand how this could be for he did not feel the prick and there was no mark after it was accomplished then the being who had taken the blood pointed at a picture on the wall and drew three circles presumably with antonio's blood and dissected them with an l-shaped mark mrs granchi thinks that the blood drawing experience came before or in between the showing of pictures for antonio says that after the busy street scene was shown he was thrown overboard and fell into a street almost opposite the paciencia station uh, when he landed there was one of the beings beside him all his belongings were with him even his bag which had not been with him on the craft uh, so basically they threw, after all of this, they just threw him out at this uh, bus station where he needed to catch his bus and there was a being standing by him for, for, for a few seconds. And then he looked at his watch, which read 2.20 a.m. He was on the ground, looked behind him and saw nothing. He then looked up and saw what appeared to be the bottom of a dark, smooth balloon lifting up. It was huge in size and ascended until he could no longer see it. Uh, Mrs. Granchi asked if there had been additional witnesses and La Rubia said there was, but the man is a known drunk and therefore not reliable. He, the drunk, told numerous people he'd seen a UFO that morning. 
Antonio went over to uh, Paciencia Station, asked the time, and it was either 2.50 or 2.55 a.m. So they had him about a, basically a half hour. Then they threw him onto the ground and then took off. They showed him all these images. But what is it all for? What was it all about? Now, of course, he remembered all these things. And he, you have to think, I mean, okay, so this guy has this unbelievable experience with these alien beings. They show him all these images, which we just went through. Uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody could decipher something out of it. I don't know what it means, but it might mean something. Uh, anyway, let's continue here. Uh, he said, okay, it was about a half hour went by, and he said he set his watch to the, at the correct time. There was a bus passing at 310, and he caught it and arrived at work on time. He felt ill and nervous and ached all over. He drove the bus nevertheless, but now and again his vision darkened. He worked all day and again all day Friday, but when he arrived home that night, he went to bed. It was at this junction in his narrative that Antonio recalled another picture we had, which he had forgotten. In this one, he saw himself with smoke coming out of his back and the pain and heat which he was now feeling when he arrived home seemed to be connected with the picture. The pictures he saw in the UFO seemed to have depicted all of the suffering he was now experiencing except the one where he passed stools in his drawer, drawers. Antonio told his wife nothing of what happened to him. Yeah, I mean, just stop there for a second. This guy, at the, at the, at, when it first happened, he doesn't even tell his wife about it. <laughs> Imagine. I mean, well, I guess what well, you're probably thinking, if I tell, tell my wife about this, she's going to think I'm nuts. Uh, again, this go, all goes back to what I've been talking about recently, that we need to have this disclosure already because this isn't fair. I mean, that this kind of thing happens to people, and then when, you know, when they're, they're, they're afraid they don't even want to talk about it because they're afraid people are going to think they're nuts. They, can't, they don't even want to tell their own family members or their own wives you know, or husbands. And continuing here, it says, uh, that Friday night his bowels were loose and he felt miserable. So I guess everything, let me just stop there again. So I guess everything that he uh, was seeing in the pictures about having uh, issues with uh, bowel movement and stools in his pants, it, it did all came to pass. But uh, fortunately for him, he was at home when it happened. The next day, Saturday, he was still very ill and missed work. Sunday was the same. He could not go to work. That night, Sunday, the burning feeling started, which spread throughout his body and was very painful. His wife rubbed him with alcohol, which relieved the distress somewhat. On Monday morning, he went back to the bus company to say he had to quit, and he had difficulty breathing, was burning and itching, and asked a fellow employee to hose him down with water. His fellow workers told him he looked as green as grass. He told Mrs. Granchi that when he walked, he had an empty feeling as though walking on a cloud. This feeling persisted as late as 33 days after the incident. The Monday that he was at the bus company and experiencing the burning feeling, the company nurse wanted to give him a tranquilizing injection, but he refused, afraid that it would make him worse. The personnel at the clinic, th clinic thought he had gone mad and ropes were brought to constrain him and he was taken to the hospital where it was generally thought he was mad because he babbled about UFOs. Before being taken to the hospital, however, LaRubia was given a hearing by the bus company psychologist who pronounced him psychologically normal but nevertheless called an ambulance to take him to the hospital. Antonio was surprised when the hospital doctors pronounced him normal despite his extreme discomfort. However, when one of the doctors visited him for his INPS or Workers Employer Relief and heard about the UFO, he called in six other doctors saying that the case was serious and worthy of further study. Also, Antonio was registered stirring a high fever, about 103 degrees Fahrenheit, which could have been dangerous to him if had it persisted. Mrs. Granchi does some philosophizing, which is very worthwhile, but which, for the sake of space, we much forego. But her closing words are, words are very much worth quoting. But the most, here's what she wrote. The, this was the investigator, Mrs. Granchi, what she said about this. She says about the, the images that the guy was seeing. But the most puzzling new facts in this case are the showing of the pictures, not in themselves as such, but what did the beings wish to communicate? This is the task for many specialized scientists to try to unravel. What message did they wish to convey? The simplest seems that as we harm them, they can harm us that there are many of them as there are many of us, that they can tell our future, but we cannot tell theirs, that they isolate people in an invisible bell, jar, and so on. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know if Mrs. Granchi was, was, was right about this. Uh, uh, what was the message uh, uh, that they could harm us if we harm them? If we, I, I don't know if that's what it was. I, I have no idea. Uh, but it was something. Uh, the message mean, means something, right? And, and this guy had this incredible experience and then uh, uh and 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 he had all kinds of issues afterward you know he was sick he was had a fever 
you know, diarrhea, all kinds of issues, and they showed them all these images. Did they? What was the intention to show one one person these images, and then, and they think in their heads that oh, everyone's going to believe this guy once when, when he talks about this because that's not how this works. It hasn't been working like this for years. I don't know what the, some of these aliens are thinking if that's the case, or was the message something to him uh, individually? Uh, I don't know, but maybe maybe the message does mean something. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever figure it out. I don't think we will. Uh, but, you know, what's going on here? Like, why, th- again, you can see that there's more than just uh, the common grays uh, that we're dealing with here. There's obviously something else uh, at, at play here, too, on this planet. Uh, and it's unfortunate, again, that we still have to... I mean, that's 1977. That's how many decades ago now. And still, all these years later, the same story, the same thing. You know, governments don't want to talk about this. They don't want to tell the people about it. This guy, went, uh, before this event happened, he didn't believe in UFOs. That's you know why? Because governments told him it's not real. It's all nonsense, and people who believe in this stuff are drunk or or, or crackpots. And then he, then next thing you know, uh, he he walks into a jackpot and he finds out the hard way that it is all real. See, that's the the worst thing about this whole cover up is that uh, you know the people we put in charge for some reason they think that they're better than everyone else and that they uh, that they need to study this secretly and quietly and forget about the the rest of the world. We can't tell them about it. Uh, and and look what happens sometimes. Um, and there's still things like this. This the, these kind of things are still happening. You, there's you know a lot of people don't want to talk about them. How many cases do you think are out there that are just like this or similar? Uh, where something happens to somebody, but they never say a word to anybody. I would believe there's probably many, a lot more than you probably could even believe or imagine. That's what I think. I think that this this kind of stuff is happening all the time, and it's and it's it's just sad. It's it's really sad. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna go. To, I'm gonna do a, a catch up on the Spotify, the recent Spotify polls, and that's what we're gonna get into next. Okay, uh, for the episode E.T.'s Possibly Responsible for Famous Power Outage slash Gary Nolan Threatened, I asked this question. Do you believe extraterrestrials slash non-human intelligent beings were responsible for the Great Northeast Blackout of 1965? 38 votes so far. Uh, Four people or 10.5% say no. 22 people or 57.9% say maybe, and 12 people or 31.6% say yes. Um, I'm going to go with the majority on this one, maybe. We don't know for sure, although there were a lot of UFO sightings uh, uh, before, during, and after that blackout of 1965, as, as we talked about in that episode. At the same time, we just don't know for sure. I probably... Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go maybe. We just don't know. But, you know, it probably was. It probably was, I'd say. You know, maybe I should throw, I should have threw in that one too, probably. Because, yeah. you know, it probably means it's a chance it might not have been, but you believe that it, that it uh, most probably is at the same time. All right, for the uh, episode, it's over. Scott Roeder proved there's an alien presence on Earth ending the debate. I asked this question. Now that there's absolute proof that shows we are not alone, what is the next step? 58 votes so far. Two people or 3.4% say, alert the Pentagon. Uh, Nine people or 15.5% say, let it simmer. Uh, 14 people or 24.1% say, alert all scientists. 16 people or 27.6% say, take it to Congress. And the majority, 17 people or 29.3% say other. Okay, I don't know what the other is, but uh, uh, I don't agree with the other. I actually, I agree with the, mi- the, the, the minority, the two other people. I'll alert the Pentagon because guess what? I am going to alert the Pentagon about it. And I'm going to alert Congress too. Uh, I think we need to start sending letters, uh, formal letters, former emails rather. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a formal email package uh, out uh, by the end of this week. I think it. I, I I mean I, I, even if nothing happens, at least you could say at least I tried. At least you tried, right? That's all you could do. You have to. You could say at least you you did did that. Well, why, and later on somebody can't say to you, well, why didn't you tell us about it? Oh, okay. Well, we'll make sure that they can't say that later on. So that's why it needs to happen. Uh, whether they do whether they do anything or not, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, actually, let's go to the next question here. Pentagon needs, to, for the episode, Pentagon needs to come clean about extraterrestrials slash NHI. I ask this question. When confronted with the evidence, how will the Pentagon respond? 42 votes so far. Zero people, zero, 
zero say disclose the truth. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Three people or 7.1% say other. 14 people or 33.3% said stay silent. And 25 people or 59.5% say lie. Um, okay, yeah, we're going to, they're going to be alerted to this, uh, you know, formally, right? Because, you know, they, they can't, then this way they can't pretend they don't know about it because they need to be alerted to it formally, I, I think. I think it needs to happen. Uh, but what are they going to do? Okay, most people are saying they're going to lie. Uh, I think I'm going to go with the 14 people who say they're going to stay silent. I don't think they're going to do anything. I don't think they're going to answer to it. Not At least not right away anyway. But then maybe later on they'll they'll lie later on. But I, I, I well, you know, maybe nothing. Maybe they'll never even comment on it. Uh, and if they do comment on it, that's the whole, that's the whole, uh, that's that's what we're talking about here. If they comment on it, what are they going to do? Disclose the truth? Zero people say no. I mean, that's not going to happen. Nobody says they'll disclose the truth. Be a big surprise though, wouldn't it? If they did, it'd be a big surprise if they did. Twenty-five people say they they'll lie if they ever do. Yeah, they probably will. They'll probably probably lie. And uh, I just want to wait. one more thing. I want to let everyone know. Uh, I'm I've been working very hard on uh, part three of my satirical series, uh, the uh, Las Vegas Alien Aftermath, part three. Uh, it's in the works right now, and I should have it uploaded onto YouTube sometime tomorrow. Uh, if you like the first two that I made, you're gonna you should love the third one. Uh, it's a little bit more elaborate, and uh, I hopefully you'll find it just as funny as the first two. And it should be uploaded to my YouTube channel uh, sometime Thursday, uh, probably by Thursday night, I'm hoping. Uh, anyway, I want to say uh, to everyone out there, thank you all for joining me. Until next time.